Hello, hello and good evening, Falcha. Welcome along. Hello, everybody. Goch dinna galair, Cade Mila Falcha. This is Live Irish Myths. I'm Anthony Murphy of Mythical Ireland. Today, we're on episode 75, Shachto is a Cuig. We've been doing these live myths, live streams, since the very first day that COVID-19 restrictions were announced in Ireland. That was Thursday, the 12th of March, before spring equinox. And I'm delighted to be able to report to you that today, for the first time since March, for the first time in over two months, there have been uh, zero deaths from COVID-19 in Ireland. So fingers crossed, let's hope it stays that way um, because it has taken an enormous toll uh, in the lives lost and the lives affected. Uh, and so we hope that it will be all over soon. Anyway, a very good evening to you. Welcome along to the Mythical Ireland Library. This evening, we are returning to Newgrange. Lots and lots of episodes coming up in relation to Newgrange. Sheon Vro, Sheon Vroga, Sheedan Broga, Sheon Brew, She Machano, Brunabonia. You call it Newgrange. That's a Cistercian 12th century name. That's relatively new uh, by historic standards. On YouTube, Flower Child is the first one commenting this evening. I'm looking forward to our time together. Blessings from Las Vegas. Two years ago today, I was in your beautiful Ireland at Newgrange for our first visit. I left my heart there. I love Ireland. Lovely stuff, Flower Child. Thank you for your nice message. Daisy Peters is also watching one of the great followers on YouTube. Falchit, my friends, Anthony and everyone. I arrived very early to one more. So exciting episode. Blessings to all. And of course, Daisy is in Brazil. Erica Rivertree says, Banachti, O oh, Louisville, Kentucky, Conasatatu, Tommy Goma. Erica Conasatatu, uh, it's great to have you along. Mandy McCurl says, Hello, everyone, from a dull, damp, misty, drech Isle of Mull. Definitely a hot chocolate with chilly night. Interesting combination. Jackie Stevenson says, Hello, Anthony and the Mythflix to a. I too visited Ireland four years ago. So beautiful and the best people in the world. My ancestors came from Dublin and Donegal. Brilliant. John Main says, Enjoying heat wave in San Francisco and looking forward to part two of the most fascinating subject. Was there last year and visited with Morgan Llewellyn the next day. A very special time. Brilliant stuff, John. River says, hello, everyone. Geoglitch River. The full Irish GK says, good evening from Tala, Falche. The full Irish. Josie Weatherford says, hello, from Austin, Texas. Weathering out a thunderstorm. And on Facebook, big crowd tonight. Desiree Riley, hello. Cy B. Geoglitch. Patricia McAteer, Aaron Durrett. All watching Jack Durkin, Falcha Jack, Donna Jean Porter says hi, Jiglitch. Barbara Barney says hi, Anthony Jiglitch. Angel Barboni Smith says hello, everyone. Banachti, Angel Josephine Meehan says Trenonoa, Anthony and Tua, Falcha Josephine. Christine Bob Belt says hello from Las Vegas, Falcha Christine. Margaret Ring is in the house. Hello, Margaret. Judy McQueen says hello. And does Jules Cousins, Falcha. Uh, both of you, Tononawa, Kristen Gray Taggart says, Anthony Augustua, Northern California is sunny and almost 100 degrees today. Today, I'm happy to stay inside and listen to stories. I was out at lunchtime and it was very sunny and very warm, but the clouds came over this evening and it looks like they're trying to break a little bit. I hope you enjoyed the pictures of the first crescent moon and Venus and Mercury all together yesterday evening in our lovely twilight sky. Kathy, Katie McMahon waves. Hello, Katie. Jack Durkin, no new deaths, exactly, brilliant. Scott Gracie, Kievra Atashiv, uh, Tom Egema, uh, Scott Conasata to Patricia McAteer says, hi from a very dull Omid. Great news today, yes, indeed. M Margaret says, evening, Anthony and all the Tua and Tulsa Fain, Margridge. Ralph Waldron says, Falja us out league in Roscommon. Nice to have you along, Ralph. Jerry Andrade says, hi from a sunny Merseyside. Gia Gutsch. Mike and Jeanette Naylor are in Princeton in New Jersey, and they're saying greetings to Anthony and all the tribe. And same to you guys. Nice to have you here. Matthew Bess Bessel says, slaunch you all from the gay Kels Falcha. Matthew, Kathy May Dayo, greetings. Anthony and the two are from Rainey, Newcastle, Washington State, USA. And that is great news indeed. Anne McDonald is watching. Hello, Anne. Come us to talk to. Aaron Durrett says, hi, Anthony and Tua. I mowed a spiral into the very tall grass in my backyard as a meditation path. Can't wait till it stops raining so I can go enjoy it. Sounds nice, Aaron. Lovely stuff. You maybe send us a picture. Marta Lopez Garcia says hello to Anthony and the Tua. I think you're in Spain, Marta. Uh, good evening to you. A lot of active cases still in Ireland, but sure, look, we'll keep the social distancing is so important now. 
We are getting there, says Paula Snow Queen. Yes, we are. Henry Paddy Shearman is in the house. Tranonawa Paddy. Donna Jean Porter, the elderly, have so much wisdom and info from the past. More valuable than gold. Indeed, Tracy O'Connor is watching. Falcha, Tracy Connors at all too. Lucy Robinson says, evening all. Tranonawa, Lucy, sorry, Tony O'Neill is in Waterloo in Ontario. And it's sunny there. Nice to hear that, Tony Falcha. Rowan Grove says it's sunny but cool in Colorado. We had over an inch of rain last night. Our weather never does anything by halves. Sounds just like Ireland, Rowan. Monique Peterson says, love the old feel, the old names for Newgrange. An unforgettable place in our journeys. Falcha, Monique. Dean T says, rainbows as well as Memorial Day. Falcha, Dean. Tom King. Good evening, Anthony. All the tour. Another lovely day. And it's story time indeed. Falcha, a homosh kunas to to long team noc says howdy anthony and fellow to a geogich alwyn roy badziak says good evening anthony and to a geogich greetings anthony from Anne mcdonald hopes life is well with you and monica mugi erstad says good evening from copenhagen falcha gary collins says good afternoon all falcha gary kelly edmiston says Good evening, my favourite prof. <laughs> hello, Kelly. Pa Padraig O'Comiskey. Hello, Anthony. Hope you're keeping well. I am indeed, Padraig. I hope you've been out and about, uh, even getting out somewhere local. Um, Nora Gaffney O'Connor says, Hi, Anthony and Tua. King Chuya will too. Candles are lit for you all. Brilliant stuff. It's great to have you along. Desiree Riley says, good evening. It's hot, humid, damp day in Louisiana. Ready for another episode of Mythflix. Good stuff. Mariana Dunn is uh, saying that it's sunny. It's a sunny Memorial Day in Virginia. Falcha, Mariana. Deborah Alland says, hello, everyone. Gia Gwich. Camilla Relland, been looking forward to this episode. Good evening, all. Falcha, Camilla. Uh, Nick Eska Casterton says, good evening, Anthony, and hi to a Trononoa, Nick. Jim Conway, Kade Maratatu, Tommy Gama, Konasatatu, Jim. I hope you're keeping well. Agape Joy, or is it Agape? Says greetings, Anthony Falcha. Twenty degrees in Mead, says Jack. Lisa Lisa Francis says hi, Falcha. Tia Marie Grady Massey says hello again from Dallas. Falcha, Tia Marie, lovely to have you along. Freyas Johom says Tronanoa Anton Augustua. Looking forward to hearing more about New Grange. Lovely stuff. And Kelly is in Paisley. Susan Bisaccia is in Plainville, Connecticut, USA. Falcia, good evening, Susan. Dean T says, Anthony, getting your book. Brilliant. Nikki Hart says, hello, Anthony, and everyone. Falcia. Sean Ogo Moelo says, hello, from Loch Gorman. Hello, indeed, Sean. David Daly says, Giagutch. Anthony, August Akharja. Falcia, David. Peter Kennedy says, greetings from Balbriggan, Balbriggan, only down the road. Hello, Peter. Keith Johnson is in Wisconsin. Loved being at Newgrange. What's not to love about it, Keith, huh? Welcome. Pat Rowan is watching. Hi, Pat. How are you keeping? Anne McCallum says, hello. From a too, too hot for me, Ontario. Wow. It's, hot. it's hotting up in Ontario. Hello, Anne. Brian Martin Fervida says, greetings from Christina and Brian in Washington, D.C. in U.S. We had the pleasure of visiting Newgrange a couple of years ago. Falcha, Brian and Christina, you're very welcome. Theresa McGuinness says, Callahan, Florida, rain filled my almost dry pond. Wildlife are loving it. I'm sure they are. Falcha. Kimberly Halligan says, hi all. Happy to be on the live session. We are happy to, ha to have you here. Ta Ahas Orof. Greetings, says Craig. Sweet, Falcha. Karim Gogas is watching. Karim is in the house. Falcha, Karim. Oh, yes. And Tracy says, Balya Brigin on Shofreshin. Trononawa Kakdina. And Tracy is also in Balbriggan, just down the road. Jude Lally says, Hello. Falcha. Emma, Emma Darcy says, Gia Gutch from Tipperary. Gia Gutch. Tussa Fane. Tarini Pendleton says, Banakti from Laguna Beach in California. Falcha. Barbara Kling says, Hi, Anthony and Tua. Trying to rain here in Vermont. Looking forward to hearing more about Newgrange. Deborah Allen, Newgrange was number one on my must-see list when I visited Ireland almost four years ago. You've got your priorities right there. Hi from Mexico's sunny beaches, says Lilia Aburto. Gracias. Falcha. Debbie Daly says, good evening. Anthony Antua, Baniga. Banakti. Louise Sherrill says, hello again. Gia Louise. 
Daniel Williams says, Jay Gooch from New Jersey in the USA, a fabulous part of the world. Hello, Daniel. Matthew Bessel, on this Memorial Day, would ask for going home prayers for William Martin III, a NAM veteran who left us last night. If folks would amplify that spirit at all. No problem, Matthew. No problem at all. Gráinne McGuinness says, hi from Antrim. Fáilte, Trinona Wach, Gráinne. Uh, Dang Min Tuyen is watching. Fáilte. Steve Martinson says, hello from Madison, Wisconsin, to all many blessings to the Mythflix clan. And right back at you, Steve. Pat Nichols says, I travelled to Ireland about six years ago from Vancouver Island. Saw a photo of Newgrange a couple of years before my trip, and it was a calling. Everywhere I went here in my city, I was seeing spirals, triple spirals, on a coffee cup, a tattoo on a fellow yogi's ankle, on a car window parked next to me. It was crazy. So I took the bus tour of the entire coast, which was wonderful, and used Dublin as a base to get the bus to Drogheda and onwards to Newgrange. Also hiked for two days in Wicklow. Loved, loved Ireland. Family routes like many other people. Blessings. Very nice message. Glad you enjoyed yourself here, Pat. Gary McCracken says, good evening. Hi, Gary. Falchia. Susan Scott says, hello, Anthony and the two. Good afternoon here. Good evening there. And good morning anywhere else. Connecticut here. Overcast, guys. Coolish. Great light in the studio, though. You know what I'm doing. <laughs> Indeed, Susan. Uh, what is the origin of the notion that Brew Nabon was more than womb than tomb? Long tea. We'll talk about that. Don't preempt the episode. Give us a chance to start. Carol Jackson says hi from Navin. Fall to ja uh, Carol. Peter Kieran's is watching. Trinonawa, Peter. Connasata too. Yvette Tillema says hi to a uh, hiid Yvette. Live broadcast is frozen, says Pat. I hope you're the only one that's experiencing that, and it's not a a, a, a wide uh, a, a widespread problem. Regina Riley says hello all. Gia Gritch. Uh, Elaine Brown Hughes is watching. Falja Elaine, how are you, Winnie? Sokolowski says, New York here, Falcha Winnie. Nice to have you along. And on YouTube, Alexis Angelucci says, Hello from Northern California. Been loving these talks while I work in the garden. Cheers. Nice. Yeah, nice. Doing some gardening. Elise Maloney says, Hello from Los Angeles. Lots of people in California this evening. Uh, good morning or good, good middle of the day to you. Good noonday to you. Uh, brilliant. Yeah, super stuff. Okay, let us, what are we on? What is that episode? What is this? Episode 75. Wow. We have to skip forward to, uh, let's call it 13 minutes. Fabulous. Well, you're all very welcome. Pull up a chair, make yourselves all comfortable. Tonight, we're dipping back into the whole subject of Newgrange and its myths and archaeology. And tonight we are asking the question, is Newgrange a tomb or a womb? And I'm not going to spoil it for you, but that doesn't necessarily imply that I'm attempt, going to attempt to give you a definitive answer to that question, of course. Uh, yes, um, Aaron, you're right. Pat Nichols, um, if you're on YouTube, you don't have to have an account, I don't think. Although you probably... Yeah, if you just go to youtube.com and look for Mythical Ireland, um, you should be able to watch there. Nolan Proctor is in the room, says, Banachti Giev, is not long Mythflix, Bal Matronona. Lovely to have you along, Nolan. Long time no see. Alison Clipsham says, Hello from Leicester, England. Glad Ireland has had a day to celebrate. Yes, indeed. Going well so far. So let us, let us, let us, let us begin with. The, the question, the big question. Some of you may or may not, some of you have, I'm sure, a copy of Newgrange Monument to Immortality. You might recognize the author. His name is Anthony Murphy. And this is chapter seven. And it is called, quite appropriately, Tomb or Womb. So let's get started. Get yourselves comfortable. I hope their mug of tea is in the hand. Packet of tato in the other. <laughs> Denny rasher sandwich in the other, you know. Or maybe maybe it's not a cup of tea that's in your hand. Maybe it's a, a glass of Bushmills. Glass of Paddy, something like that. Wine, whatever, you know. Red or white. I'm easy. There is a long-running debate between archaeologists and other researchers and experts 
about the true nature and purpose of Newgrange and its sister monuments. Archaeologists say they were primarily tombs used to inter the remains of the dead with possible secondary functions. Others say they are temples, shrines, observatories, portals to the other world, sound amplification chambers. And there are even some who say ancient sites such as Newgrange were inspired by visitors from space at some time in the distant past. There are dozens of published theories and probably hundreds more unpublished. Tour guides at Newgrange hear a range of speculative ideas on a daily basis from visitors eager to share their own theories about the function of the site. Mez Marion uh, is on YouTube and has made it from the Isle of Al Alameda. Very, you're very welcome, Marion. Pull up a chair, make yourself comfortable. Gin and tonic for Jerry Andrade's, lovely. Whatever you have in yourself. There has been much disagreement between the various parties to this debate. Archaeologists, oh, my blackbird friend is there. I think I'll open the window. Archaeologists love labels and passage tomb or passage grave is a label that seems to suit Newgrange quite well, in their opinion. Others deride what they consider an oversimplification of the function of such a truly remarkable site. One argument, oh, Rowan Grove is on the home-brewed mead. Well, it's an awful pity that we can't grab the mether and share it round with the current situation that it is. It, it could also be a little bit difficult given that you're in, where are you, Rowan? You're in Oregon, are you? It could, could be a little difficult that we're 3,000 miles apart, but it's only a minor uh, it's, it's only a minor argument. One argument holds that there was simply too much effort expended in the construction of Newgrange Nowth and Douth just so that they could be used to inter the remains of a select few people. They must therefore have been constructed for some greater purpose. So I just want to see how much I have to read tonight because I need to pace it, you know, just right. Because I don't want it to be over really quickly. Because I know you guys don't want it to be over really quickly. What's that? Uh, yeah, we're, we're going at the right pace, I think. Since the popularization of Newgrange following Professor O'Kelly's excavations, a succession of writers has attempted to re remold the story of Newgrange, reinterpret the meaning of its design and layout, and to redefine its purpose. Some of these have, with perhaps some degree of hostility and even a touch of naivety, dismissed the tomb idea completely, preferring instead to thrust their own lavish interpretations on the masses. A great deal of hostility was generated in the 1980s when Irish-American artist Martin Brennan and his coterie of friends and researchers came to the Boyne Valley. Brennan discovered that one of the chambers of Douth was illuminated by the light of the setting sun on the winter solstice. That was 1980. This, that's, imagine that's 40 years ago now. Oh, man. The same year he and Jack Roberts had discovered that Cairn T at Loch Crew, County Meath, some 50 kilometres or so northwest of Brunabonia, 30 miles in old language, was aligned on the equinox sunrises. Vicky Wallace, Southall is here. And I hope Evan is with you as well. Hello to Vicky and hello to Evan. Good evening to you. Yeah, I really can't believe that like 1980 is 40 years ago. It doesn't bear thinking about. But anyway, nobody's getting any younger. These discoveries were very significant, making major media headlines and thrust the whole area of ancient astronomical knowledge and scientific endeavor into the limelight. However, both sides became entrenched, with archaeologists sticking to their guns in calling Newgrange and the other Boyne sites tombs, while the Brennan camp said that the apparent refusal of archaeologists to investigate the astronomical purpose of the mounds was, in many ways, quote, one of the greatest blunders of modern Irish archaeology, unquote. It's 
things got ugly. Brennan claimed archaeologists were not objective enough and that their reconstructions of the mounds had been, quote, disastrous, unquote. The archaeologists, meanwhile, were naturally upset at being insulted, and contemporary anecdotal accounts would suggest that a war of attrition broke out, with both sides equally engaged. Rosalie says, can't stop now, but we'll catch up later. That's absolutely fine, Rosalie. Jay Gwich, anyway. Hopefully you'll enjoy the catch-up. Newgrange archaeologist Claire O'Kelly was less than gracious in her review, and I have review in quotes, <laughs> of Brennan's book, The Stars and the Stones, in 1983. And here is a quote from said review. As an archaeologist, I find myself at a loss as to how to attempt a review of this book or to say anything favourable about it, beyond the fact that it is well produced. It contains errors, misrepresentations, innuendos, and even sneers at the expense of what the author calls, quote, modern archaeologists, unquote, of the Irish breed, of course. Francis Smith has joined us. Giagach, Francis, it might have been difficult for an objective casual observer to discern the motives behind the disagreement and understand the finer intricacies of what should have been a much more friendly discourse. The main problem was that there was a perception that Brennan and his team were stepping on the toes of archaeologists and claiming new discoveries from under their noses. While archaeologists were apparently not ready to accept cosmology as a key function of the tombs, especially when these ideas were, metaphorically, being rammed down their throats. The divisions between the two sides were too deep and they continued to trade insults. So I'm just going to make a very slight adjustment to the, uh, the YouTube camera. Apologies. It was an unfortunate episode in the history of exploration of Newgrange, and a needless one at that. Both sides had contributed enormously to our understanding of the Irish megalithic culture. Liz Finch Belcher says hello from Virginia. Falcha, Liz. Indeed, the cosmology enthusiasts could not have made some of their discoveries had it not been for the diligent work of the archaeologists. While the archaeologists were perhaps dismissive, of some of Brennan's claims. The lack of mutual recognition from either side seemed to add fuel to the fire, as Claire O'Kelly's letter indicates. Yet this book is another Claire O'Kelly quote. Yet this book, Neil is in France and saying hello, Melo Nello, Falje, good evening, Neil, bonsoir. Yet this book could not have been put together without the contributions of these same modern archaeologists unacknowledged by Brennan, except in the rarest cases and in the vaguest terms. By the way, uh, I, I have mentioned before, uh, and I could be probably mentioning it again, but uh, Martin Brennan uh, uh, eventually fled Ireland, um, partly in disgust, um, and possibly might never have come back again, except for that I made strenuous efforts to reach out to him he was living in Mexico, I think he still is, in 2009 to come to Ireland and to give a talk at a conference and to try and sort of maybe heal some of those wounds. Here is a photo of myself and Martin at the Curbstone 52 at the rear of Newgrange. And uh, that was taken on uh, uh, winter solstice in 2009. And uh, I remember going to the airport to collect Martin. Uh, and his friend who had travelled all the way from Mexico with him. And uh, 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 three quarters of an hour after arriving at Dublin Airport, there was absolutely no sign of him. And I thought perhaps he had missed flights or something. And eventually he emerged and told me that the delay had been as a result of the fact that it was December in Ireland and freezing cold and there was some snow on the ground. And he had come from Mexico where it was something like 38 degrees Celsius and uh, that he was in the bathroom putting on his long johns. <laughs> Brennan left Ireland under a cloud in the mid-1980s 
and the episode obviously hurt him deeply because he didn't come back here for another 25 years until he was keynote speaker at a conference near Newgrange in December 2009 entitled Boyne Valley Revision, of which I was principal organiser. And of course, that name is a derivative of the name of his first book, which is The Boyne Valley Vision. And so we decided to call the conference the Boyne Valley Revision. As it happens, the content of Martin's talk was almost entirely about uh, uh, Mexico, Mexico on sites there. Uh, and in relation to the uh, uh, this uh, famous um, uh, calendar, uh, Aztec snow, Incas, no. What's the famous 2012 countdown, end of the world, uh, long, you know the one I'm talking about, it's just not uh, coming into my head at the moment. Um, but he certainly believed that um, that didn't actually predict the end of the world, as many people had written books about. Mayan, the Mayans, thank you, it's the Mayans, yes, yes, yes. I saw Brennan's return as an opportunity for healing and to recognize the gravity of his contribution to our understanding of Newgrange and the other ancient passage mounds. Thankfully, a great deal of healing did take place during the visit, and Brennan was gratefully introduced to a large number of people, including a couple of archaeologists, with whom he had perhaps been less friendly in the 1980s. Afterwards, he described a meeting with Professor George Ogan as, quote, warm and genuine, and seemed very pleased at the friendly welcome he had received in the Boyne Valley. Archaeologists are commonly faulted for describing Newgrange as a passage tomb and criticised for using this label without sufficient evidence. Author Chris O'Callaghan suggests the evidence does not support the use of the word tomb. There was no sign then or later that Newgrange had been used as a catacomb, a mortuary, necropolis, royal or otherwise, or a crematorium. Despite the assumptions, there is not the faintest evidence that Newgrange had ever been used as any sort of dedicated repository for bodies, bones, burial artefacts or ash. Nor have the interpretations been able to show that any of the patterns carved into the stones signify death or burial in any way. Despite the mantra of modern academia, the application of grave or tomb to Newgrange is unsupportable. Now, just for the record, folks, because I know some of you are going to ask, I disagree with that. I disagree. There is absolutely evidence uh, that there were burials, not just in Newgrange, but in all of the excavated uh, mounds in the Boyne Valley at Fornox, at uh, uh, Don O'Neill, at Tara, uh, at La Cru, at Sligo, you know, uh, and the list goes on and on and on and on and on. Perhaps there is a point here. This is me playing devil's advocate, of course. Yes. Sorry, Coda, Coda wishes to make a point. Okay. Yes. Okay. Good. Yeah. Yeah. He says, don't forget to mention the dog bones that were found in Newgrange. Good. Nice of you to think of your canine friends, Coda. I appreciate your input. Now, if you could stop interrupting, that would be great. <laughs> he goes further by suggesting that this is uh, O'Callaghan, Chris O'Callaghan, by suggesting that laboratory testing of the Newgrange bones uh, was unable to definitively date them. Well, I don't think there was dating done on them. Certainly, no link was suggested, let alone established, between the human bones and the date when Newgrange was in use. He points out that Edward Cloyd... That's L-H-W-Y-D. I could be wide of the mark with the pronunciation. The first antiquarian visitor to Newgrange after its rediscovery in 1699. It's like, I always find that funny, you know, people say Charles Campbell discovered Newgrange in 1699. Oh, look at this massive cairn of stones over there that nobody has noticed in the past few centuries. Look what I found. I found a monument. And in fact, what had happened was that his laborers had stolen stones from the front of it and had found the entrance to the passageway. So the interior of the monument was re-entered for the first time in a long time. He points out that Lloyd, the first antiquarian visitor to Newgrange after its discovery in 1699, did not, quote, suggest the presence of human bones, unquote, in any of the four letters which he wrote about Newgrange. The, 
The considerable evidence of burials and cremations that one might expect of a community of the size that built Newgrange has not been found in the three centuries since it was reopened. And th those are my words, not Chris's. It could be therefore reasonably deduced that, quote, while the, new, while the Boyne Valley people obviously found an efficient means of disposing of their dead, cremation and or interment of bodies and bones within the New Grange monument was not one of them, unquote. And we're back to uh, the dog bones, Alison, were actually in the chamber. And perhaps we might get a chance to talk about that. That, that last quote was from Chris O'Callaghan again. But some defense of archaeology must be made here. How can generations of archaeologists have wrongly labelled Newgrange? And if there isn't enough evidence, why do they persist with the tomb ideology? One of the reasons is because similar monuments were found with significant bone deposits. At the Fornox Passage tombs, for instance, there was a great deal of bone material, burnt and unburnt, found, including the remains of at least 21 children in the Fornox One site alone. The passage, okay, somebody has said that the bones were never dated. Uh, Mark Munoz says hello all from a sunny hot New Mexico good evening Mark you're well welcome along um, I can't read. Teresa says the bones were never dated but yes I think that's correct not to my knowledge anyway but the bones that were retrieved from Carol Keel uh, was that Cairn G or one of one of the cairns at Carrow Keel in 1911 were dated and they were found to be Neolithic. I don't think it's a substantial argument, you know. I don't think it stands the rigors uh, of in. Um, uh, I, I don't think the argument um, uh, stands against the evidence. However, the evidence is a little bit flimsy in the case of Newgrange. The passage of this mound, that is Fornox One was stuffed almost to the top with a mixture of stones, clay, and human remains. In the eastern chamber of Nauth, a, quote, general blanket deposit of cremation, three to 15 centimeters deep, existed all around the sides of the left recess. There were a further six deposits in the right recess. Judith Nylon is in the house. Good evening, Judith. Fulge gave a mention to two of your books in the second uh, tour of the Mythical Ireland Library, uh, which happened a few episodes ago. Um, just a reminder to everybody, of course, I always think of it uh, uh, in the middle of the episode instead of at the beginning or the end, but just a reminder that if you're new to Live Irish Myths, you can see all the previous episodes on the YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash Mythical Ireland or on the Mythical Ireland blog, and that's mythicalireland.com. And if you go into the blog, you'll see the post there about uh, live Irish myths. And all of the videos are embedded, every single one of them to that page. Uh, library tour part two is the one we're looking for. Uh, Judith, you might be interested in watching uh, episode 73. So that's two nights ago. Uh, oh, I, I mentioned both your books, uh, Legacy of Wisdom and Call to Chrome. A uh, lot of reaction, by the way, to those as well. A lot of people expressing interest in your work. Uh, and I was telling them uh, to go to your website if they're interested in following up uh, with a purchase. So hopefully some of them did that. And if they didn't, there you are. They can talk to you tonight and uh, perhaps uh, discuss same. Sorry, I'm just trying to paste this in here. And then I'll proceed. Thank you. That's now as a comment under the Facebook feed as well. Where was I? There are different types of tomb too, such as the portal tombs and court tombs, and here evidence of burial in the Neolithic has been ascertained. At the Poulnebron or the Poulnebron portal tomb in County Clare, the remains of at least 22 individuals were found dating to between 4200 and 2900 BC. Julianne Osborne is watching Geoglitch, Julie. Nice to see you, Julianne. At Ashley Park in County Tipperary, a Linkardstown type tomb 
the bones of a man of about 60 years of age were radiocarbon dated to between 3650 BC and 3350 BC. Archaeologists don't pluck ideas out of thin air. They have labelled Newgrange a passage tomb because it is comparatively a best fit for the available evidence to hand. Quote, virtually every Irish passage tomb that has been excavated had within it human remains, unquote. And, and I'll just read what, the, what that's from. That's footnote number 13. And that's from uh, David... Lewis Williams and David Pierce inside the Neolithic Mind, published 2005 by Thames and Hudson. In addition to all this is the fact that archaeologists readily admit that tomb does not describe all the functions of Newgrange or similar monuments. They are open, they are open to questioning the idea, quote, that the structures that archaeologists usually term megalithic tombs only or always functioned as tombs, unquote. And I think that's from the same source. But I will check, just to make sure. Some of you may be interested in following these sources yourselves. I think at least somebody, you've all been posting library pictures lately, a lot of you on the Mythical Ireland community. Somebody had Lewis, uh, had that uh, inside the Neolithic mind on their bookshelves. Yes, indeed, that's from the same book. Neolithic expert Gabriel Cooney says it is now often suggested that megalithic tombs, quote, should be seen instead as repositories for select ancestral remains and as foci for ancestral rituals, as houses, temples, and shrines for the ancestors, unquote. The term tomb is retained by archaeologists, but they do recognise that the sites had a variety of functions. This is reinforced by another archaeologist, Dr. Elizabeth Tuhig, who acknowledges that, in some cases, there are very few human remains found in the so-called tombs. And this is a quote from Elizabeth. Careful consideration shows that the monuments cannot have been built solely or even primarily for burial. Many have very few burials in them, while in some instances, the paucity of human remains may be due to tomb robbing, for example, Newgrange, the overall impression is that only a very small proportion of the population can have been buried in the monuments. The small number of burials demonstrates, therefore, that the function of tombs was not merely as a place for the disposal of the dead. Do you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to mark the notes page as well so as I can flick back and forth handily. Uh, and that is uh, Elizabeth Tuhig, 1990, Irish Megalithic Tombs, Shire Archaeology. Archaeologists also recognise that the deposition of the select ancestral remains might have included ritual activity that involved, quote, encountering the supernatural and or the ancestral powers who are in charge of human destiny. Uh, and that, again, is a quote from Elizabeth Tuig. In this way, encounters with the other world occur at sacred places that are, quote, liminal between this world and the spirit world. Uh, and uh, I bid same, same work again. It is clear from the above that modern archaeologists are not stuck in some archaic, outmoded line of thought. Their own interpretations of various megalithic sites span the sacred and spiritual as well as the scientific realms. In the minds of some archaeologists, Newgrange could be comfortably relabeled a, quote, temple of the ancestors, unquote, or something similar. It really doesn't matter all that much. The vast majority of archaeologists who have studied the Neolithic will readily admit that the ancient stone monuments were more than just tombs. Chris O'Callaghan interestingly labels Newgrange a temple to life, which is the title of his book. Ken Williams is watching. Fáilte Ken. Connors a tattoo. Ken Williams is my uh, co-discoverer uh, when we were flying our drones out at Newgrange there in uh, almost two years ago now, in July 2018. 
Uh, and uh, Ken, I really, really loved your photo of uh, winter sunset at Drombeg. Uh, and I was planning to share it at an opportune time when I know it will get a better reaction. I didn't want to share it in the morning time uh, because the half of the United States is still in bed at that time of the morning. It has variously been described as a spirit temple, a star mound, and of course, a passage tomb. The Lithuanian-born archaeologist Maria Gambutas might have preferred the label passage womb because her study of many ancient European structures led her to conclude that many of them were shaped like the female body. And just in case you're looking for a reference there, that is the living goddesses, Maria Gambutas, 1999, University of California. Newgrange is no different in this regard. It has been suggested that the ridge upon which it sits presents the, quote, impression of a large image of a pregnant woman, unquote. And that is from William Battersby, uh, the late William Battersby, whose books we mentioned in the first library tour and in one or two episodes since the, the Orion episodes. Uh, and that is um, The Age of New Grange. And I see that one of you got your hands on a copy of that secondhand, an ex Mead County Library copy. <laughs> a, a rare one that because it would have been self-published and there would only have been, I'd say, maybe maximum 500 copies printed. It has often been said that the passage and chamber of Newgrange, cruciform in shape, also portray the female reproductive system. Chris O'Callaghan imagines the mound was created to represent the Mother Earth. Accordingly, the end chamber would represent the womb and the alcoves, the ovaries, the basins in the alcoves, ready to hold the symbolic eggs chosen to be fertilised. During consummation, Entry to the womb could only be reached via the sun window and along the passage leading to the end chamber, or more accurately, the nuptial chamber. And there, there ends the quote. The prehistoric monuments of Europe show that the process of death and transition was viewed differently in ancient times, according to Gimbutas. In Neolithic religion, she wrote, quote, the processes of death and transition were cyclical, unquote again reinforcing the view that the cosmic vision of the Neolithic people held everything to be part of the grand cycles of nature and the cosmos. Uh, and this is another quote, which I presume is from Gibutas, and I'm just going to double check that it's the same work. Apologies for the backing and for forthing. Yes. As in the organic world, this is Gibutas, where new life grows from the remains of the old, Birth, according to the old Europeans, was part of a cycle that included death. Just as the goddess's womb obviously gave us birth, it also took us back in death. Symbolically, symbolically the individual returned to the goddess's womb to be reborn. Exactly what form this rebirth was imagined to take is unknown. What is clear is that old European religion understood life and death as aspects of larger cyclical processes. And of course, if you just bear in mind uh, the, uh, the plethora of uh, circular uh, and quasi-circular megalithic art uh, at Newgrange and its sister sites, perhaps there's something in that uh, in relation to the idea of life cycles. Camilla says, we archaeologists need to recognise that our modern idea of burial or tomb is not something we can put onto a prehistoric perception of what the megalithic were used for. I say definitely temples, definitely sacred places. Also, they were built and reconstructed. The stones were reused for new constructions, often on the same site. The site itself is important as well, absolutely. Uh, Ken is saying, uh, Ken Williams is saying, O'Kelly, who excavated Newgrange, and Francis Lynch, who's another archaeologist, thought the tomb was closed after the burials were put in, but that is unlikely. I just wonder about that, Ken. I've just speculated in previous episodes about the possibility that the cairn collapse wasn't such an accidental collapse or earth tremor or sudden thaw after a frost, and perhaps the cairn was deliberately sealed off. I don't know. Uh, I'm just thinking about the fact that the burials in Fornox stopped up the passage until it was full, you know, uh, and perhaps at that stage they allowed the roof to collapse in and, and the thing was sealed off, you know. 
Her study, uh, that is Gimbutas, of monuments in Europe, in particular the early shrines of Lepensky Vir in the Iron Gates region of Serbia and Romania, which date to 6500 to 5500 BC, led her to suggest that such structures could be considered wombs as much as tombs. Quote, vulva and uterus images, both natural and geometric, predominate. They can be found in the architecture of the tomb or as symbols of the tomb itself, unquote. And Kelly Edmiston says, birth, death and rebirth, triple spiral. Yes, indeed. Many writers have pointed to the womb-like qualities of the design of Newgrange. One suggested that Newgrange's interior was, quote, shaped like the female generative organs. A long, narrow passage resembles the birth canal, leading into the main chamber like the womb, with the two side chambers to resemble the ovaries. Newgrange was constructed to resemble both tomb and womb. And that is from Maureen Concanon, the, sa the sacred whore, Sheila Goddess's goddess of the Celts, and that's Collins Press, 2004. The same author suggests the purpose of Newgrange was, quote, both spiritual and cosmological, unquote. Veronica Casey is saying, hello, hello, Veronica, good evening. Some of the possible cosmological reasons for, the, for its design will be explored in chapter 14, which we are not reading tonight what time are we on we're we're in plenty of time we're doing we're doing grand we're doing we've loads of time christopher knight co-author of oriel's machine also sees the similarities examining a plan of the new grange tunnel and chamber it appeared to him quote to be highly reminiscent of the female re reproductive organs unquote in the artwork on the stones of Newgrange and its sister sites Maria Gambutas saw regeneration as being one of the main themes. Quote, there is a clear affinity in symbolism between the life column within the egg slash cave slash womb and the cup mark or dot in circle or concentric circle, unquote. And there we go, the concentric circle. And there's that idea of cycles of life perhaps being represented in art. And of course, the vast majority of this it has to be uh, speculative because we don't know and we can't go back in time and ask so we can formulate theories uh, and hypotheses. But can we prove them? Can we put enough meat on the bones to make them acceptable? Uh, it's like building a circumstantial case, I suppose. Newgrange has strong associations with the Tua de Danon, including the Earth, Moon, River, Milky Way goddess Bowen, who gives her name to the river beneath the monument. Yeah. I should have said in front of, not beneath it. it. doesn't flow underneath it. And to the cosmic river of the sky, that is the Milky Way. Bowen is the archetypal matter day, one element of an ancient divine trinity that included the Dagda, the sun god, and Angus, the miracle swan child. And their stories are infused with miraculous imagery, which may stem from a Neolithic preoccupation with themes that include creation, procreation, and the all-pervading idea of cosmic regeneration. Uh, and of course, uh, to suggest that such mythology is Neolithic is indeed a brave and sometimes foolhardy step, uh, but it's one that I have taken on many occasions. As a lunar goddess, her rhythm is strongly tied with the gestation period of both humans and cows. And if Newgrange is to be considered her earthly womb, then perhaps a sacred union with the solar dogda can be viewed in the context of the joining together of creative cosmic forces. Yeah, uh, just in relation to that comment about uh, they were excarnating bodies rather than cremating them. You see, they could still. Uh, the likelihood is that they were they were they were they were cremating and or excarnating uh, the bones in other locations, such as perhaps the four posters, uh, the the small. Um, the small they're not that small the one that ken found ken williams found the night uh, of the drone hinge discovery is very very substantial uh, the biggest one found so far but there are several four posters or or grooved wear timber circles in 
uh, the Brunabonia area. And it has been suggested that the four posts in the center of those supported a wooden platform upon which remains were excarnated. Uh, and, and I think uh, Hartnett in, in his... Uh, um, his paper about Fornox, which he excavated in fifty one, that Fornox two, he speculated, was the place where the where the remains were actually cremated, but that Fornox one was the place where they were buried. Some effort has been made by this author to suggest a link between the original name of Newgrange, Brunabonia, and the word tomb. Sorry, and the word womb. <laughs> the early Irish word brug, or uh, it would be lenited, uh, b r u g h brew means many things, but all tied to the idea of an abode. It can mean a palace, a mansion, a house, an abode of fairies, a hillock, a tumulus, or a fort. The old Irish word bru, B-R-U, is a different word and means womb. The two words are not apparently connected, being from different roots. The modern spelling of brunabonia, or brugnabonia, is brunabonia, B-R-U, fada. Nabonia, due in no small part to the fact that at some time in the past, uh, brew became brug became brew. In other words, the word the word was softened, and later the spelling changed to b r u fada. But brew nabonia still derives from brug mansion, not brew womb. This does not detract greatly from the idea that Newgrange might have been constructed to represent or symbolise a womb. It is one monument of many scattered across Ireland and Europe and indeed other parts of the world which may have been built by devotees of, quote, an ancient rebirth ritual wrapped up in sophisticated astronomical observations, unquote. We have seen from Valency how there was a plethora of Irish terms and concepts representing the idea of patterns, cycles, returns, periods, revolutions, circles and rings. In the worldview of a Neolithic farmer astronomer, it is not difficult to imagine that life itself was seen as part of the grand cycle of things. The builders of Newgrange watched the sun grow and fade as it moved north and south along the horizon over the course of the year. They saw its strength dissipate as the year waned towards the solstice, the winter solstice, and in the dim light of the stone womb, it died and was reborn in one continuous movement. Is it possible that by placing some remains of their recently deceased ancestors in the dark chamber on the night before the shortest day, their hope was that the soul of the deceased would be reborn into the next world, transported there by a beam of light from the new sun? In Irish mythology, the other world is regularly seen as being underground in caves and chambers and mounds. It is also perceived as being in the Atlantic Ocean, way out beyond the furthest western and southwestern coasts of Ireland. Regularly, it is also associated with the sky, and the entrance to Tirnamio, land of the living, was said to have opened when the sun was touching the earth, that is, at sunrise and particularly at sunset. Indeed, it is after the sun sets that the light fades and the stars begin to appear. The apparent confusion between a subterranean otherworld and a stellar otherworld could be explained if one thinks of the journey to the afterlife as one that necessitates both. In this view, the spirit of the deceased must first encounter the night, returning to the womb-like darkness, mimicking what happened at the beginning of physical life. It was there, in the early darkness of life, that the fetus awaited in innocence the push of the labour pangs and the journey down the birth canal towards the light of a new life. That new life could not begin without first the long stay within the dark cocoon. Given that so much of what was happening in the world was viewed to be cyclical, we should not be surprised if our Neolithic ancestors saw the beginning of physical life, the ending of physical life, and the dawning of a new spiritual incarnation as part of a cycle, much like the patterns which they saw repeating over and over again in the sky and in nature. And of course, there's lots and lots more I could add to that in the eight years that have passed since I published it. Uh, one thing that I hadn't read until more, much more recent time was the work of Mircea Iliade, uh, and particularly his book, um, the myth of the eternal return uh, and how he, he felt that the regeneration of the cycles of the sun, but particularly the moon and the planets, uh, it gave 
great hope that the cycles are always renewed on earth, that, that there is birth, there is growth, there is decay, there is death, but inevitably it comes around again. And just at the moment, by the way, in the Western sky, we're seeing the death of Venus, uh, the, not the absolute death of or end of Venus, but we're seeing a death of Venus because we've watched it for the past six or eight months as our evening star, and it, it reached maximum west, uh, maximum eastern elongation, its furthest distance from the setting sun uh, in March, and was a nightly uh, companion to many of us uh, during the COVID lockdown, and a wonderful, wonderful sight. It is now stooping rapidly towards the sun. Now, it will re-emerge in the morning sky in a few weeks' time, and in August, it will reach maximum western elongation from the sun, which means that it will be a very, very brilliant uh, morning object uh, for those of you who are early riser risers. And of course, in the summertime, that means you're probably looking at three o'clock, maybe four o'clock in the morning. For surely a people who lived so closely with nature saw all the risings and fallings, the comings and goings, the birth and death as natural rhythms in the pattern of nature and by extension life itself. They doubtless perceived that the rise and fall of the tide was connected with the movements of the moon, that the new crops they planted were nourished by the growing strength of the sun, that the migratory birds of the Boyne Valley arrived and departed at the same time each year and that the leaves fell off the trees in the late autumn. Not forgetting to, uh, as mentioned by our good friend, Robert Hensey, the archeologist in his book about Newgrange called First Light, uh, he mentioned, of course, the migrations of the salmon in the Boyne River. And, and I think he, he, he says the largest of the three uh, annual salmon runs is the one in wintertime, uh, which often lasts from Samhain until Imbolc and would provide a nice bounty of food at that time of year when perhaps supplies are a little bit diminished. Although it's not the winter you have to worry so much about if you're farming. It's it's the spring uh, and, and you know, um, the early summer um, because you're waiting for the harvest. A great deal of what they could see happening before their eyes in the valley was occurring as part of a pattern or cycle. Why, therefore, should we be surprised to learn that the builders of Newgrange might have considered its chamber as a giant womb of the goddess Bowen, from whom the valley and the monument is named. Bowen was the great archetypal mother who was one of the divine race called the Tua de Danon, who are said to have withdrawn into the mounds, waiting perhaps in the stellar other world to one day return to interfere again in, in the affairs of humanity. It is not at all beyond the realms of possibility that Newgrange was considered both a tomb and womb by its builders. In this regard, we must approach our study of Newgrange from an esoteric perspective as much as a scientific and logical viewpoint. After all, even Professor O'Kelly acknowledges that his archaeological work at Newgrange does not contradict. I speak in present tense as if he's still alive. And of course, for many people, O'Kelly's still, still alive. And a lot of people have great regard for him and his work. The, the quote, concept of Newgrange as a house of the dead and an abode of spirits at one and the same time. In other words, he did not dispute this. Why, therefore, should we not consider it a place of death and birth concurrently? The ultimate truth of the matter is that archaeology recognises that Newgrange is much more than just a tomb, although whether all the latter-day writers and theorists will acknowledge that it is a tomb at all is another question. So what I'm saying is uh, the archaeologists have been uh, big enough to admit that the tomb label doesn't describe all its function and it is perhaps uh, inappropriate or not fully appropriate. Uh, but a lot of the people who are writing about uh, ancient sites, would they perhaps admit that uh, at the very least there is evidence that they were used as tombs, among other things? Laura O'Domitroy is saying good evening to you all, good people. Fawlcha, Laura. Yeah, there's a, dis a discussion going on about the basins being birthing basins. I, that's the very, folks. I'm not a woman, but like I, I had five kids, and you know, I was at the presence of the birth of all of them. A stone basin in the chamber of Newgrange is not an appropriate place to give birth. It really isn't. I, I, I don't, I don't go along with it. I, but that, look, that's my own personal view. So, um, it just does not seem to me to be an appropriate uh, or fitting or uh, hygienic. There's so there's so much that's wrong with it, you know. Um, but look, 
you know, I can't say it isn't, can I? And do I have evidence to say that it isn't? No, I don't. One more aspect of the interpretation of Newgrange is worth mentioning here. And that is the idea that interpretations change according to a person's own beliefs and social milieu. The many interpretations of Newgrange can, quote, say as much about their authors as they do about the tomb, unquote, 33. Uh, that is from Stout and Stout, Matthew and Geraldine Stout. I had a feeling that was the case. In general, archaeologists still refer to Newgrange as a tomb, and there is little deviation from this description, despite the many reservations that individual archaeologists might have about whether this term adequately describes the monument. Do they see it as a dead thing, and the people who created it as a people who have vanished, of whom no trace survives in any way? Neil at the Kell service didn't have the budget to build a passage tomb, says Ken Williams. <laughs> Same old problems, Ken, huh? Same old problems. <laughs> a great deal of visitors and writers who are spiritual or esoteric in their outlook about Newgrange see it very much as a living thing, and many see a continuation or a resurgence of the old ways and beliefs. There you go. Eva Anderson, I think, agrees. Or comfortable. I've seen the basin. I've given birth. And no, just no. <laughs> <clears throat> there is a, genuine, a, a, gen, a very genuine conviction among some people that the place is spiritually alive and for whom the description of Newgrange as a tomb is anathema. There are still a great deal of people who frequent Newgrange and the Boyne Valley and other ancient and sacred sites such as the Hill of Tara who feel a powerful aura a great energy at these places. Some archaeologists consider these people to be disconnected from reality. Others are more accommodating of the various beliefs and ideas surrounding Newgrange. The open-minded visitor will perhaps sense and understand many of the feelings that Newgrange engenders in people. Those who are open to spiritual energy encounter sometimes profound experiences and in general, they will always thrive upon some deeper energy energy from unknown sources. I have seen visitors to the Newgrange Chamber on the solstice mornings place their hands upon spirals in the recesses and meditate as if they are literally drawing a mysterious force or energy from the stones. One person who recounted, and I should say there's a separate chapter about people, uh, their experiences of being in the chamber during the solstice illumination, and perhaps we'll come to that in another episode. One person who recounted their experiences in Newgrange stumbled over words. This is all very overwhelming. Obviously, this is a personal experience. It could be like a retreat. You can't help go to that place. I'm sorry, if you can't go to this place at some level of spirituality, you need to see a drink. There is a problem, a, a big problem. <laughs> there is a word, numen, which comes from Latin and is used to describe what people experience and cherish and desire about their excursions to sacred and ancient places. Numen means a beckoning from the gods. And metaphorically, it, quote, connotes a spiritual force or influence that human beings associate with an object, a phenomenon, or a place, unquote. The phrase Newman seeking was coined by Rudolf Otto in his 1958 book, Idea of the Holy. Adam Rory Porter is watching. Good evening, Adam Rory. How are you? Uh, those for whom Newgrange... Sorry, uh, sorry, sorry, I, I missed a quote there. Uh, according to Otto, quote... A numinous experience is a sort of religious rapture or ecstasy, a deeply spiritual effect that places and objects can have on us, unquote. Those for whom Newgrange is a numinous experience might more readily accept the idea that it is a womb. In seeing the monument as a place of birth or rebirth, perhaps there is a recognition or belief that the spirituality of Neolithic times is returning. This should not be surprising in light of the spiritual crisis of modern times and the enormous falling away from the traditional church that has been hit by repeated scandals and an increasingly outmoded image. People who feel a detachment from the religion they were brought up with or for whom there is a spiritual emptiness in the traditional church 
might feel more at home with a cosmic or natural spirituality such as that found in the Neolithic. And I would expand much more on that nowadays. And I think I have in later work. I made it sound all very simple, but it's much more complex than that. And of course, uh, par part of the reality of Neolithic life uh, is, is that it can be harsh and it can be brutal, you know. With the political, economic and religious institutions and systems of modern Ireland in deep crisis, of course, this was back in 2012, who's to say they're not still in that state, it is no wonder that people are turning in greater numbers to the shrines of the pre-Christian past for some sense of their personal spirituality. For those archaeologists who still believe Newgrange functioned primarily as a tomb, the monument is a dead thing and its people long gone. There are stones and bones and implements, fragments of a story from the lost yesteryear. For those who might cherish the notion that Newgrange is a womb, they perhaps come to this great shrine to be re reborn in the womb of the goddess, to encounter spiritual forces which are still very much alive. And that, my dear folks, is chapter seven of Newgrange Monument to Immortality, Tomb or Womb. Don't want to read the whole thing because I'd like you to actually still buy a copy. But you know what? Uh, I think there'll be another couple of chapters from that. Uh, before the week is out seems to be people are enjoying it as well and seems to be provoking uh, a lot of discussion and questions let me just see if there's any bit on youtube that i've missed our brew and brig cognate says arrow i don't think so uh dil.ie the electronic dictionary of the irish language is a fabulous resource for uh, word connections oh especially the earlier irish paula grogan says i can't help but ask, how would Neolithic people know what the female reproductive organs look like, particularly the ovaries? Do we think that Neolithic people dissected dead bodies? Absolutely we do, Paula. Yes, indeed. And I think there is evidence for that. They they, they, they um, uh, dismembered uh, and excarnated bodies. Uh, somebody processed them. Uh, somebody processed them. And in fact, there may even have been a processing of the bones after cremation because the... the, the, the the bones, fragments that were found in many of the passage tombs were, were very small and fragmented in nature. Shane Gribben is watching. Hello, Shane. Falcha. Chad Gummit says, thanks for sharing this wonderful history. Great channel. Thanks, Chad. And of course, to the YouTubers, I would say, and it's something I, ne I never say in my videos, don't forget to subscribe. Subscribe to the YouTube channel if you want more. Kujam Rasalgeti, who is named after two stars, says, I'm watching a family of geese in my pond and walking around my front yard. A dad, mom, and weak old gosling. What a lovely family. Lovely. My mother's father is Irish of the Curly clan. Her mother is great granddaughter of Maria Theresa, daughter of Marie Antoinette. Wow. The full Irish says, somehow I think they knew a lot more than we give them credit for. Ah, uh, yes, but there's so much that we assume too, and that's part of the problem, isn't it? You know that uh, we have had... Sorry, I'm going to take a screenshot because I've never seen 242 people watching. Um... Uh, part of the difficulty is that uh, a lot of assumptions have been made and a lot of claims based on very loose evidence. And of course, as I've often said, uh, my, my Newgrange book is a subjective work. It's not, it's not a thoroughly objective work. And it would be wrong of me to try and say that it is. Uh, however, um, if you look at things on balance, you would have to say that given the technology that they didn't have, and that's it's been argued that you shouldn't even call it technology because we're dealing with implements that were made from stone, from flint, uh, stone axe heads, porcelain, that sort of thing, uh, wood and bone. They didn't have any metallurgy. They didn't, as far as we know, write anything down. They may not have had a complex language, although I think they had a reasonably complex language, especially if they were able to communicate complex ideas such as cycles of astronomy, etc., etc. But there is so much that we assume about the Neolithic, and there's actually so little that we can know based on the physical evidence. Because at the end of the day, um, you know, what does a stone axe head mean? What does uh, uh, a bead that formed a necklace mean? What does a fragmented bone mean? Yes, you can say quite a lot about the physical evidence. Uh, but as somebody often says, if you dig the floor of a cathedral in a thousand or two thousand years time, you'll find burials underneath and you'll find that it's cross-shaped. Does that mean you'll then label it a cross-shaped tomb, uh, you know, uh, and perhaps like that, uh, the, uh, the great monuments that were called in Irish. And that's another thing I should have had in that chapter. 
she and of course i reintroduced that in the mythical ireland book she is a word that is that does doesn't have an adequate translation into english as far as i'm concerned and she encapsulates the idea of an access or a crossover point a liminal place uh, where worlds meet uh, and i think that's probably the best notion of it often described as uh, uh, fairy mounds but she and fairies are the the fairies are very very late arrival into this uh, onto the scene you know uh, ken says good point three is some passage tombs has have sill stones and a younger and even a younger self struggle to get over yeah plus not to mention the fact that the passage in newgrange is, is sinuous and you have to bend down it's not a practical place however i robin who i think started that uh, discussion uh, was quoting uh, uh um uh, a midwife look i think uh if you you brought uh personally uh, uh and of course they, this is very as a very subjective statement i think if you brought uh a hundred or a thousand women into newgrange one by one into the chamber of newgrange and said what do you think of those as uh, birthing uh, locations i think they'd give you your answer i don't think us men should be talking about such matters to be honest and the blackbird is wonderfully singing out the last of the light as the sun goes to dip down behind the horizon. Hope, folks, I'll hang around for a couple of minutes in case there are any questions. Just, just the usual reminder uh, that uh, I'm very grateful to all the patrons of Mythical Ireland who support what I do. Uh, if you're interested in becoming a patron, I'm going to paste in the link to the Patreon page uh, where you can support Mythical Ireland for as little as $1 a month. And for higher amounts, you get rewards. Yes, you get stuff that other people don't get, or you get stuff weeks before everyone else gets it. Uh, so go on over and have a look if you want. Um, a cross shape can also be a crossroads somehow, says Sandrine. That's an interesting point. I think the overarching point about the cross shape of some of the passage tombs is the fact that here we had basically a, a shape that was obviously sacred to people in in pre-christian ireland uh, three to four thousand years before the arrival of christianity uh, which is an interesting thought um we are going to have an episode ken williams if you're watching we are going to have an episode very soon about the reconstruction of new grange uh, Ken, I would be very glad to have your company for that because you will undoubtedly be able to answer questions that I can't answer. I am going to give my perspective on it. I know it's an area of great controversy uh, and a little bit like the womb versus tomb argument. Don't expect me to be to become coming down absolutely hard on one side or the other. Uh, I will present a reasonable uh, look at both sides of the debate and let you make up your own minds. Uh, so that will also be this week. We seem to have a new Grange focus this week. If there are any questions, I'll take them. 54 on YouTube, says Jackie Stevens. This is the highest number yet. Brilliant stuff. E. Causey said, had fun today. Thank you. Well, thank you for coming along. Liz Finch says, I love solar crosses. Mandy McCurl says, thank you, Anthony. Another terrific episode. Brilliant stuff. Seamus Marr, time flies, doesn't it? Just the full Irish said, that said, what is the meaning of the zigzag chevron shape? The point and the answer to that is nobody knows. Nobody knows. Who can know? We can all speculate. Looking forward to it, says Ken. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll maybe get in touch with you, Ken, about what night is good to have you around for that. Uh, it'll be, it'll be, it'll be in the next few days. Um, just because I, I would be very happy to have your expertise on that one. Uh, I think you're probably the most knowledgeable person. Uh, about Newgrange and its reconstruction uh, that I know personally, and it would be great to have you here. Uh, but I will give my own uh, interpretation of it and my own thoughts on it. With that, we'll say good night. Folks, it's been lovely as always. Thanks for coming along. This has been 75 uh, episodes. Are there any resources to look at about birthing rituals? Not that I can recommend, Veronica. Perhaps some of the other TUA members can help you there. And if you don't get it here and now don't forget to go over to the mythical ireland community which is a separate community uh, to this page uh, on facebook uh, where you can uh, ask that question and perhaps there will be people over there who can help you don't forget also the irish stones uh, group uh, of which myself and ken williams are administrators uh, along with Derek Ryan, uh, is another great group for answers to questions about Irish megalithic sites. That is, Irish stones shouldn't be difficult for you to find. Uh, so perhaps uh, head on over there uh, when you get a chance as well. Uh, so if I can't answer your questions, bear in mind that there are nearly always experts who can.
In relation to what the uh, megalithic art means, uh, I, I once knew a folklorist in Drada who is now deceased, who claimed one day at a talk being given about the great Neolithic sites by Gabriel Cooney, actually. So that's 20 years ago. Um, he said that, I know what the triple spiral means. And everybody turned around and looked at him as if to say, somebody actually knows. And he goes, it means Cade Mila falls you. <laughs> and with that, good night to you all. Don't forget to keep washing your hands. Maintain your social distancing. Two meters in Ireland. I don't know what it is elsewhere. If you're going out, it is best to wear a, a, a face covering. Make sure your nose and your mouth are covered, especially if you're going into shopping malls, shopping centers, anywhere where there's going to be people congregating. Stay safe, folks. Keep well and keep coming back every evening to watch Live Irish Mets. I have really enjoyed your company this evening. I wish my blessings on all of you. Movanacht Oriv Goler or Fodon Down. Blessings to you all around the world. Kolosov, safe sleep and uh, Slonga Fold. Bye for now. We'll see you all tomorrow night. Bye bye. And YouTubers as well. Good night to you all. Ikawa.